I didn't like look in the mirror or check my teeth or anything. I was just like <laughs> sitting here. I'm like, all right, here we go. How everything's Welcome going? everyone. How's it going? Everybody alive and streaming? Merrily, merrily, merrily. Life is but this stream. How are you today? <laughs> <laughs> is the stream in the room with us right now? <laughs> I'm good. We uh, just filmed an episode of Stephanie for our Patreon. That was fun-ish. Mm -hmm. And we are, oh, we've got some uh, some stuff to read today. That's all I'll say. This has been wild. I've been going through, um, basically, I found all of these contemporary news sources of uh, people either who left Mormonism or who, who had observed the Mormons or whatever, just uh, people writing at the time about uh, Mormonism and polygamy and specifically how uh miserable its women were and how polygamy was a system of as slavery. attested by the leadership of the church yeah <laughs> and it's just it's just wild to read you know it's always like uh don't judge uh people in history by today's standards specifically but... <laughs> the leaders of the church right we yeah. get that in regard to joseph smith and brigham young specific on the specific issue of polygamy oh you're imposing a you know a 2023 vision onto you know, mid 19, 1900s people. And it's like, no, the people in the, in the mid uh, 1800s, they shot that guy to death. Cause they were like, uh, -uh he's secretly marrying uh, his foster daughters. <laughs> yeah, It's, it's been, not good. <laughs> there's honestly more insane stuff than we're even going to get time for today. Yeah. I it's uh, Samantha and I were just talking about this, how, even like the idea of me, <coughs> like the ex-Mormon, Mormon thing, talking about Mormonism as like this outsider who's just trying to tear it apart out of, I don't know, uh, just like sheer dark compulsion, Satan. like Satan, Satan yeah, I guess, uh, versus like, this is me on a genuine quest and Samantha on uh, her own private genuine quest to like, understand our own faith including the history that's led up to the present moment to inform where we we're going in the future and like how to best interact with people and build systems that benefit and like bless in the real sense of the word like actually help people and a lot of that is dealing learning to deal with complexity realizing that things aren't as simple as we may have learned when we were in the first grade about how the world works and the more we you know tear back the curtains and see the the mechanics and how the sausage is made it, it you know it's important that we learn how to talk about these things and these particular subjects are so heavy and so intense and invoke such a strong reaction in people that it's hard to even engage in the space without just being overwhelmed with the vitriol that comes out in talking about it and so, you know, with the Tim Ballard stuff going on and the toll that that's taken on me personally, like mm -hmm. with my actual connections and relationships, including with friends and family involved in the project, um, some who are like, whoa, this is nuts and others who aren't. Um, and then in my own research and talking to other people, like it's just heavy, heavy, mm -hmm. heavy stuff. And so we appreciate your support um, as we've done this. Um, it's also just like, it's just spooky. It's always spooky, like looking at how the how the world works and saying that like, wow, shit's really fucked like yeah. across the board. And I don't think the answer is just to go in every time guns blazing and just, you just, you know, beat it, bonk the right skulls together and ooh, we've solved the problem. Like that's been the patriarchal method the colonizer method that, you know, that we've are getting, we need to get away from, we have to get away from like, what it's antithetical to peace. You talked prosperity. in the last video about, um, there's like a more mature hero's journey. Yeah. Oh, what that was, was a Grant Morrison mentioned? thing. Okay. Yeah. Just talking about how the hero's journey, you know, the Campbell thing. I took a class on it at BYU. I, you may have too. It was like a required, one uh, option of a required humanities bracket. And I took the hero's journey class and it's, you know, uh, Campbell talking, he's a mythologist and psychologist and talking about the, how there's this kind of archetypal cycle underlying all stories from Star Wars to Beowulf to Moses. 
um, where the the hero, the boy hero, goes on this quest and discovers the gift and saves his people and bonks the right skulls and acquires the right weapons. And uh, it was Grant Morrison. I don't know. I doubt he's the originator of this, and I'm sure that they would attest the same. Because, um, but the idea that like that's not how the real world world works, and what we need is a, a like it's not about the boy hero. It's an interconnected web of equally important actors and agents with varying degrees of, um, you know, different motiv complex motivations that are constantly playing out and values, contradictory values that are at play among different peoples in really complex systems. So yeah, all we're trying to do is bring some complexity to everything. And then you do that a little bit and people are like, oh my God, you're, defending him and trafficking and you want to and it's yeah it's, it's people, harrowing a bit. Um, <laughs> i feel like people always ask me oh is it is it really bad like all the the negative comments you get on your videos and generally i'm like it's actually not too bad like there'll mm -hmm. be there'll be comments from people who are you know full-on uh all about jesus or mormonism and and uh but but they're easy to just sort of like dismiss those ones but for the most part I don't ever feel like assaulted by our comment section mm -hmm. but the Tim Ballard video uh has been the first time in a long time where it has felt like that just mm -hmm. people a lot of people calling us pedophiles which is sick you know good one um and just uh, a, a scary energy because because people genuinely do believe that they are uh defending children in the same way that uh, the Nazis believed that, or, you know, people in Germany believed that they were defending children or defending the vulnerable by hating the Jews. Like it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just been, it's been a weird week. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess we're still like talking about stuff in the same vein, but it feels a bit nicer to be talking about something that is uh, more distant as opposed to something that is more ongoing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for tuning in, the 100 of you that are here so far. Um, we will be taking super chats throughout the stream. We also have our Venmo in the description box if you don't want YouTube to take, I think it's a third. Um, we'll read out like Venmo uh, super chats too throughout the stream. So yeah. yeah, and also shout out to our Patreon supporters. Without you, we couldn't do this. So thank yeah. you much, so much for your ongoing support. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, should we... Uh... Take the old dive. Yeah, what I think we... we should start off by talking about what human trafficking is because yeah. that's just like a whole misconception that needs to be dealt with immediately. Because when you talk about human trafficking, and especially in regards to the way that like Tim Ballard takes it, it's like you know, the image that's conjured is like people who are stolen out of their cribs as babies and sold to these people who are exploiting them. And someone's got a bust in there, guns blazing, rip them from the arms of, and, you know, and arrest the guys. And Tim's also mostly concerned with child sex trafficking, right? Not right. child trafficking across the board. Right. As far as I know. And so the, um, but the problem is that that's not, not to say that that doesn't happen because we live, we truly live in a fucked up world. But as far as like when people, when people are quoting human trafficking <laughs> uh, statistics, what they're talking about is any exploit, any movement of people for exploitation of human labor. Mm -hmm. So that includes migrant workers, that includes undocumented uh, immigrants, that includes um, could be like a family business that's pl that's uh, making its children mm -hmm. do work, like work in a restaurant uh, or, you know, in a situation where they're crossing state lines for some kind of thing like that. And this does get a little murky. Like I'm uh, definitely in favor of like child labor laws and things like that, which is pretty insane to see the right, like repealing those right now, along with child marriage laws. Mm -hmm. Um but I also realize that it is complex, um, especially in areas of that are like deeply impoverished be, and uh, especially among immigrant families, impoverished immigrant families where they really like genuinely need workers in a family, everybody like mm -hmm. contributing in order to just get by. Like I admit that it's a very tricky and precarious situation, but that's why I'm so in favor of trying to help 
people in those systems receive the help that they need rather than uh, just trying to, you know. Yeah, just to do the the kind of like the, you know, the building the school without reforming the local system such that kids actually have access to teachers and education in that school. Yeah. Like it's more than just building the school. It's more than just plucking a certain number of kids out of a fabricated situation you've created where sometimes these kids are being trafficked by you for the first time. Mm -hmm. That's a whole other thing. Watch our Tim Ballard video. So this is scary to see like Tim Ballard and meeting now with Donald Trump after the sound of freedom going and keep in mind, Tim Ballard, he, he talks about how he's like, basically like a CIA agent works with the FBI Homeland Security. Ice. He's worked for ICE. He's like uh, at the border, a border patrol person, uh, very steeped. He's like a political, uh, his, his degrees are in um, poli sci. It's like, okay, this is all just political theater, literally political theater. Um, yeah. And he's also, uh, Again, like people will be commenting on our last video saying like, what's the problem with him raising awareness? Like, mm -hmm. what's the issue? And it's like a lot of these right wing anti-trafficking efforts, like, for example, will push the solution that, uh, you know, more border control is the answer because like immigrants are the problem. Immigrants mm -hmm. are trafficking kids when it's like actually immigrants are much more vulnerable to being trafficked, to having their labor exploited due to the fact that they are immigrants. Right. Also, a lot of right-wing anti-trafficking organizations that are just raising awareness have enacted bills that have criminalized sex work more, mm -hmm. which has made life more unsafe for people who are already in a situation that is often very desperate. And again, this is all, we talked about this in our other video, but- And this is the problem with the, the like Trump, Tim Ballard political alliance theater message right now is that Trump literally announced, if I'm president, we're going to put to death human traffickers. And he's not talking about that's when you conflate human trafficker, i.e. just a person who's being, who's being moved for labor exploitation. They're not, they're being paid under the table. And that can include a, a like a spectrum of potential coercion. Not always, sometimes, of course, there's like a possibility there. And, uh, but then also, uh, but just being able to, sorry, being able to label it as like, oh, a human trafficker is the worst type of person and we need to kill them all. Well, then it's going to be like a, anyone who's exploit. doing like even uh, like what ought to be legal sex work mm -hmm. who can't is, could be punished under that. Trump would People, be punished under that. Undocumented because... workers, uh, migrants, migrant work, migratory workers. Trump is Refugees, famous. like. Trump is famous for exploiting undocumented immigrants and just people in general. Like, there's so many stories of Trump. Mitt not, Romney's not the people, people doing Mitt Romney's fucking it's, yard. Yeah, like <laughs> the actual by the actual definition of human trafficking, I'm pretty sure Trump's being guilty of it. Like, he's absolutely exploited the labor of uh, well, both legal and illegal immigrants. And yeah, so when you hear those like massive numbers, it's not that number of those numbers are super dubious for a lot of reasons, but mm -hmm. like, it's not the number of like kids being sold into sex trafficking. It's human trafficking, which is a much, much, much broader umbrella. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, it's, it's not that we're trying to like minimize the fact that like child sex trafficking happens. It's just like, it serves us all to have a more accurate understanding. Yes. And when groups use these inflated numbers, it does create like this moral panic where every, I mean, like stranger danger that we a lot of us grew up with where you just mm. constantly feel like your kid is going to get snatched and sold into sex trafficking. And mm. it's like, none of us knew anyone that that happened to growing up. I mean, I'm sure some, you know, so that everything exists, but mm. um, yeah. Anyway, today we're talking about Mormonism. Which creates this like hyper paranoia. Yeah. And only. Uh, and often like the vilification of immigrants and Well, that's, sex that's the whole workers. thing is like, all of this is political theater designed to leverage people's strongest emotions against political enemies, which in this case is sexual, racial, political minorities. Yeah. The woke left, the queers, the undocumented immigrants. It's bullshit. Thank um, you to Lisa for the Venmo <laughs> super chat. Finally here for a live, even if I'm a little late. Thank you. We appreciate you being here, late or not. Um, okay, so this is all a great segue into the Mormon history of human trafficking because 
for as much as the political theater machine enterprise uh, wants to paint this one picture, there's this whole backstory that they're not even aware of or able to address or acknowledge that we're only doing so because we're like initially had the faith to look into it in the first place and then had the willingness and the desire to try to sort through it. Thank you for going on the journey. And as always, your super chats are appreciated. Yeah. All right, Sam, what did you find when you took a look? <laughs> Every time I take a look into the historical box, into like, I just scratch the surface and it's like, oh God, the most like putrid, uh -huh. uh, rotting field of skeletons that have never been acknowledged by anyone in the history of this faith. Like, wow. <laughs> I like, it's so easy to like, obvious point but like newspapers existed when mormonism was founded <laughs> so there's a lot more than you think uh there there are just so 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 many contemporary they were sources. all anti-mormon if joseph had lived long enough he would have burned them all down <laughs> yeah so uh to give kind of a general overview of what i discovered reading a bunch of these which again i've picked out some that we're going to read today um because we can't get through all of them but so many of these contemporary news articles talked about how Mormon women were like miserable and kind of vacant looking and uh, never smiled, which we know was true because even Brigham Young. <laughs> uh, I think I have the quote here. I'll look for what's it. What's the word? He, um, why can't I think of the word for like schooled, uh, admonished <laughs> Mormon women for not being pleasant and smiley enough because, you know, they were miserable from polygamy. Um, so many people at the time compared Mormon polygamy to slavery. Um so, so much so that the 1856 Republican convention, the, the official party platform was to end the twin, quote, twin relics of barbarism, slavery and polygamy. One was seen as the um, coercion, the, for, the exploitation of labor of people based on race and the unlawful exploitation of labor based on gender. If you say... The wife belongs in the home. She cannot leave. She has to submit in all things. She's not, a, you know, she must submit to the man, even as he submits to the father. And her job is just to clean and up and tries... raise the children. I'm sorry. That's the forced exploitation of labor. Yeah. And in 1856, the Republicans were like, this is the biggest problem in America. <laughs> Yeah, we always get that comment on our videos. Like, the Republicans are actually the ones that ended slavery, or were against slavery, and we're like, we know, and like, do that now. Yeah, right? Sick. Um, yeah, there was a lot of, I think we're going to get into some of this, but there was a lot of news articles of people just uh, disgusted by the fact that in Mormonism, you know, 70-year-old men were marrying 11-year-old girls. I think that's something we're going to read. Oh, yeah, because that's something you hear all the time, right? It's like, people are like, oh, you can't judge people in the 1800s based on modern standards. Let's that's presentism. The contemporaries judge them. But then, then you look at how the people back then judged him, and they literally shot him to death. Like, they were yeah. like, this guy's got to go. And they're like, he's marrying his young, he's taking in servants that he's calling his foster daughters, but they are they come in under the premise first of working for him and then they're his daughters. So he doesn't got to pay him because they're just his daughters. And then suddenly he's fucking them like literal human trafficking. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of news articles um, talking about the fact that the Mormon missionaries would go to Europe and would recruit often, especially pretty women uh, to come over to uh, the States, depending on what stage in Mormon history it was, wherever they were. Um, and these women weren't told about polygamy, nor were the men that came over a lot of the time. Uh, and then then they're trapped there in, in polygamy dominated Utah. And that we also have multiple stories of uh, women trying to escape and being trafficked back, including a story about Brigham Young's daughter who tried to escape and John Taylor's daughter who tried to escape. Whoa. So, yeah. John Taylor, the one who prophesied that the polygamy could never and would never be taken from the earth, the very lest the very gospel of Jesus Christ be turned on its head? That one? Oh, man. Y'all, let me tell you. It's a lot. It's a lot. I mean, it's fine at this point, but it's a lot. I'm glad we're all here together. Um, I was looking for that quote from... Sorry, I Brigham you Young. <laughs> I put on cover up. And then I sit on camera and I'm like, ooh, I feel like weirdly exposed. <laughs> oh man, it's crazy. Like, 
Mormons have just never been on the right side of history from like day one. Do you want to start by reading? Um, so this was a, a someone, a guy who had joined Mormonism and had emigrated, I think, to Nauvoo. He's from England, <clears throat> and then he managed to escape, and then he wrote to the New York Times. Um, and anyway, we'll hear it, but uh, yeah, I think this is an interesting place to start. Oh. Um. Okay, yeah. So this is someone who apostatized, basically. And uh, oh, yeah. what? it just hit me that, uh, like, uh, hotels, motels, common places for sex trafficking, right? And just, like, sexual activity generally, because uh -huh. it's like you just get a room. Uh -huh. um, Joseph Smith in in uh, Nauvoo ran a hotel where he's taking and lived in this hotel where he's serving alcohol. And like, I don't think that's nothing like. Wait, he did what to the hotel? Um, funded a hotel. Oh yeah. And bankrolled a hotel. Well, because sometimes he, he was lived in. he was secretly marrying women that had husbands and essentially just meeting up with them secretly, right? Yeah. So yeah, I mean that's one it of makes, the hardest like, things about out. having affairs. It's like where are you gonna have the affair? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. How about your hotel that you buy that you pay for on Tithe Paradigm? Yeah. I'm sorry, I just read this quote from uh this is from 1886 where he says Joseph kept eight girls in his house, calling them his daughters. And that is true, including a, a couple of sisters who were told not to tell each other about what was going on. Emma threatened that she would leave the house and Joseph told her, all right, you can go. She went, but then Joseph reflected that such a scandal would hurt his prophetic dignity. He followed his wife and brought her back, but the eight daughters had to leave the house. Um, do you want to get into this? Or is that, should we... Yeah, sorry. Willard realized that Emma had refused to believe that any of the young women boarding at the mansion when it was first used as a hotel had been married to Joseph. She had struck Eliza Snow at the head of the stairs, and Eliza, it was whisper whispered, had lost her unborn child. Um, I know that there's some speculation on that story about her getting struck and stuff, so I wouldn't put that forward as, like, true okay. fact. But the fact that there was discrepancy about Emma and the mansion and Joseph's wives is true. So much so that Brigham Young said Emma Smith was going to hell mm -hmm. for saying it, for not agreeing with and submitting to Joseph. <laughs> I remember the missionaries who converted me talking about that in hushed tones, like- uh, Reverently being like, she will go to hell. No, yes. it, it was like um, something along the lines of like, Joseph went through hell for her. Or oh yeah. To, like, like atone for her sins in some way. Oh yeah, because Brigham Young yeah. said, if he's going to get Emma Smith in the afterlife, he's going to have to go through hell to get her because that's surely yeah. where she is. Ah, okay. So again, this is an account written by a guy from England and the New York Times wrote in the intro, after a few years of slavery in Utah, he worked his way to Sacramento where he wrote this letter, hoping it would be the means of preventing others in that country, England, from being deluded by the misrepresentations of Mormon proselytes the pollutions of whose system he became disgusted with and thus describes. So he said, uh, sir, in my last letter to my mother, I promised to send you a little of my experience while in Salt Lake, which I was afraid to do while living there as my life would have been in danger by so doing. But as I am now in a free country, I can flutter my wings and can send to my friends the truth of things as they exist there without being afraid. Are you listening? Kind of, but I'm also reading okay are um, you worried you're gonna miss some juicy i'm not worried. i'm worried you're gonna miss some juicy no you know we do a little a little research a little that uh, you know it's an in and out i think you're gonna want to get into this story all right, though. All right, all right. like all the stories are worth getting into okay. um for those of you who just joined we are doing taking super chats and we're also taking super chats by them though if you don't want youtube to take a third of the money so uh he said in my previous letters, I've been very silent on the polygamy question. I think a little news of that kind will be very interesting to you and a few of your friends. In the first place, old men of 70 marry girls at 14 years of age. And in some instances, they give the parents of the child a cow or an old gun or some other trifling thing. 
So, I mean, that's buying a daughter for one. <laughs> no, it's a dowry. It's very different. It's a very different word. They don't even sound the same. <laughs> I also read another account from a guy where he said old men of 70 marry girls as young as 11. Uh, um, in the next place, a man will marry a girl and that girl's brother will marry her husband's daughter. And very frequently, a man marries two or three sisters. But worst of all, many go so far as to marry a woman and her daughter or daughters, as the case may be. Again, the missionaries from there to the old centuries urged the immigration, especially that of the females. And many women have, when they had not sufficient means to emigrate with their whole family, immigrated with their daughters and left their husbands and the rest of the families, family to follow them next year. We're going to hear a story from one such man who was left behind and then uh, met his wife and daughter in Utah, and it's chilling. Um, so he said... In many instances, when the man gets there, he finds out that his wife is married to another man. And should he be so fortunate as to get there with his wife, he has to keep one eye open all the time or he will lose her, especially if she has the appearance of being a smart woman. For I can assure you that they are a set of old men with one leg in the grave and the other out, crawling round after women. And should they see one that they think they would like, they will tell the poor woman that her husband can't save her and persuade her to get a man higher in priesthood than her husband. This checks out. <laughs> they quoted Brigham Young yeah. in the Journal of Discourses saying. <laughs> yeah. All of this stuff, it's like, it's, it clearly is accurate because we have, we have quotes from Brigham and others that back up that this would have been the case. Mm -hmm. um, they will tell the poor woman that her husband can't save her, persuade her to get a man higher in the priesthood. And these old cripples often succeed in getting her away. And the poor man can't help himself. It is the order of the kingdom of their God. I've told you how they marry. I will now tell you how some of them live. I will speak of those in the neighborhood I lived. Three of my nearest neighbors were polygamists. One, an old man who had no children. He lived, he lived pretty fair with his women. The other two lived like devils. They used to fight and call each other filthy names. If the man has means enough, he gets a house for each of his women. If not, they all live together. One young woman that we were acquainted with went and listened one night at the window of the other wife of her husband and heard something that she did not like. She up with her fist and broke almost every pane of glass in the frame. And for the pants, for the, I don't know what that word is. She broke her wages where several of her teeth knocked out. Uh, a sister of one of the apostles has no less than four husbands and all living. Women there, if they don't like their husbands, go to Brother Brigham and he gives them a bill of divorce for which he charges $10, which I imagine <laughs> is quite a significant amount of money back then especially as a woman where, how would you even make money? Which her late husband- At least he let him divorce. At least he let them divorce for money. <laughs> I can assure you that there is not that happy smile there upon a woman's countenance, which characterizes an English woman. I don't really buy into that because I don't think English women are that smiley, but- No, that if, tells you. That tells, <laughs> that you, tells you how tells you. they were. If you think that English women are the- More miserable than the British. <laughs> <laughs> there, there shouldn't be anything more miserable than that we are a resting bitch face nation personified yeah uh, many of them as soon as they get here begin to peep through the wall that has been drawn over their eyes so there's a lot of uh quotes basically describing that like people especially women are being trafficked to utah you know being urged to emigrate by these missionaries and they're not, they haven't been given an accurate picture of what they're going into, like they've been lied to, which is part of human trafficking, right? Someone giving you false promises of like, you know, abundant living once you're there. And But in this case, it's like they're often not even knowing about polygamy. The women don't know that they're essentially to become sex slaves to these old men. Like you have the, um, yeah, that clip from John Taylor and his mission in England after he had married three wives. Yeah. Didn't publicly deny him. Publicly said he wasn't polygamy. doing it. Yeah, so you can, yeah. As well as others, of course. And some some people that came over that immigrated to America for Mormonism were of means, but, but a lot of them weren't. Like there's there was one article about how the missionaries targeted a lot of really impoverished women in Switzerland. Anyway, let's finish this because we're nearly done. So many of them, as soon as they get here, begin to peep through the wall that has been drawn over their eyes, probably for years, and some of them come out and say Mormonism in Utah and Mormonism in England has no comparison. I found it so long before I got to Salt Lake, but I would like to have found it out before I left my home. At any rate, I'm quite satisfied now and have come to this conclusion. That's just him saying he's glad he escaped and everything. Uh, but that's just one guy's account. 
of, uh, but it, it's corroborated by a lot of others that I read, different people who all left the fold. Oh yeah, it's, um, we, I've plugged uh, wife number 19 a couple times and she talks about that. And again, with this idea of like, oh, people back then had different standards. Uh, they married young all the time. And it's actually, it's when you look at the census data, it's like, actually not really. People tended to marry people of the same age. It was very uncommon for men in their 30s onward to marry young teenagers, so much so that in many censuses, it wasn't even included. It was considered so far off the map and so occasional that it wasn't even worth recording. So to be like, oh yeah, this is totally normal. That was one of uh, Eliza's, uh, or excuse me, Sarah, I believe, wife number 19, uh, that was one of her criticisms, was like the predation of young women. That was something that was on the Republican National Convention's uh, platform was like, this is hurting mm. young women. <laughs> and Brigham Young, we have it like, the idea that it was like, oh, it was this, there were of course some women who argued like this is empowerment for women. And this is where things get a little complex that it's like a person can be a victim and totally not identify as a victim right. and not be able to validate the genuine victimhood of others. And as somebody looking at that, first of all, not being a woman and being removed by time and having more context and things like, I want to generally like take people at their own story while also trying to understand as much as I can that's not just their story because we're all more mm -hmm. than the stories that we invent about ourselves in our head. Like that's and not the real picture. You can like believe that that is a woman's reality yeah. and also acknowledge that the system, it, I mean, it's like when uh, slaves were freed in America, some of them didn't go like mm -hmm. not, I mean, I imagine it's like that with human trafficking too. It's not like everyone is just desperate to escape. It's like, no, they've, they've been like, so broken Mental, by them, yeah, conditioned exactly. by the systems of oppression, right? That even viewing it as oppression is not possible. So There's nothing to be escaped has the from. Been. But of course, that's my perspective, and theirs is just no. This is what I want to do, and so it's like that. Ah, and uh, like like with all trafficking, the victims are also kind of the perpetrators because there it exists in these gray areas where people are both being hurt and helped mm -hmm. at the same time in different ways. And that's not to say, um, well, it's, yeah, it's not to say, okay, well then you're not a victim, but it does give some like, yeah. okay, we have to be complex about how we approach this stuff. You are being generous though, because everything I read was like, these women are not happy. I'm um, anyone who's seen, uh, Oh, that, that, yeah, no, truly. Sorry. Yeah. I, you know, I'm doing this because I've just been so conditioned to the, like, Every, like, our like comment someone's section has great been truly great grandmother harrowing. in her journal was definitely like this is an amazing thing but it's like yeah that's what humans do when they're in when they're suffering is they find meaning in their suffering and of course like part of the reason the exploitation and was so successful is because most of them did believe that uh joseph smith was a prophet brigham young was a prophet yeah. so they gained status yeah in that alignment and a lot of the marriages were like power power deals essentially yeah um, no, yeah, I, I did not mean to minimize because again, twin relics of barbarism, they literally associated and we got to point out that the Mormons were a, not all the southern states were in favor of slavery were in favor of polygamy. In fact, most of the Christian states hated the Mormons and polygamy. And again, we have to admit that like there was some bias against people just having multiple partners mm -hmm. as a product of the time like that sucks. And, and there's a lot of language to that effect that like it, and as a polyamorous person, I'm like, it's not like that, but you know, you're working with what you got. And we can acknowledge that the ways that the Mormons were implementing, it was fundamentally predatory in ways that uh, are abusive. Like the way that Brigham talked about women was not like an empowering way. It was like women submit. It was men are allowed to take as many wives as they want. Joseph Smith can take as many wives as want. It's never adultery for him. Now, if I catch my wife sleeping with someone else, it's a javelin directly through the heart because God has given me the right to kill. Yeah. Thank you, Amanda, for the super chat. We really appreciate Thanks, it. Amanda. Do you want to get oh, into Oh, and I was going to end. I, I wanted to find that quote where he, he was talking to the wives 
about how all of them at some point point, and he literally says both old and young feel this way that it's just like the worst burden to bear uh -huh. and they're miserable and they haven't seen their husband in months and they feel like their needs aren't tended to and rather than like showing any kind of compassion or giving them any dignity it was just like listen Shut up I'm going to set you free. That's the language he put. I'm going to set you free or you shut up and submit to your husband, submit to the priesthood and go to hell or go to hell. Like, yeah. And it's like, that's not a, that's not a feminist. That's not a person who has like a gracious or noble view of femininity mm -hmm. in any way. The fact that you think you even deserve like one woman to be your property is shocking when you care so little about women. Yeah. Right? You watch Keep Sweet Prayer in a Bay, right? Um, I started watching. That's the only cult it's dog really I've ever hard. watched that I could that I was like yeah. too triggering that I couldn't finish. Well, reading these, uh, yeah, it, it it's early Mormonism is the spitting image of the FLDS Church. Like the 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 same system. As much as they try to do fundamentalism, is literally like the guys who refuse to budge on any of it. They're like, nope, we're gonna keep doing this, and they just have. And the Mormon Church is like, we're not like them. We're totally different. It's yeah. Like. That was your guy 150 years ago because Brigham Young married children and uh, Wilfred Woodruff married children and John Taylor married children and Lorenzo Snow, you're never going to believe it. That guy married children. Joseph F. Smith, remember the F? I actually don't know about him. I would have so to So it sounds like to dig. <laughs> God's children are for sale when God is like the CEO of the business. Oh, as we will hear it's from Brigham not... Young talking about buying up Native American children. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you, Meditation Circle. Spitting facts, DNC 132.39 allows concubines. Is that true? That is true. Also interesting, speaking of Joseph Smith, or Joseph F. Smith, remember the F, when he F'd it in the Reed Smoot hearings, you can look up the transcript online. Um, he's being questioned specifically over DNC 132. And he's like, and because the, they're saying like, you don't believe that women can consent, essentially. It's like being like Mormonism is an oppressive system that inherently uh, victimizes women. And Joseph F. Smith is on the stand. He's like, DNC 132, it says that she gets to consent, right? And he's like, right. And he's like, and then it says, but if she doesn't consent, she'll be destroyed. And he's like, right. And he's like, so if she can, if she doesn't, she has the power to consent, but if she doesn't get consent, does she get destroyed? And is that consent? And he's like, it's just that she just gets to disagree or agree, but ultimately she has to, or she'll be destroyed. It's like, that is crazy. And that was a matter of like congressional hearings back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry. I've, I've totally derailed. <coughs> no, no, you have a very valid point. So as I said, <coughs> both Brigham Young and John Taylor's daughters tried to escape and essentially the local police, which were all Mormon and under the prophet's control, uh, caught them and brought them back. Um, and also just so disturbing to think about because like, Brigham the Young's daughter would have been born in this thing. So she's certainly not consenting. I mean, mm -hmm. you're not, a lot of the immigrants were not consenting because they they weren't told what they were uh, signing up for and you can't not consent. before me. Hey, you're going to go to a system where a man can do anything and you have to submit all the time and you're going to yeah. be his third wife. <laughs> so this is the story of Brigham Young's daughter trying to escape. Uh, this Shelley Miscavige of, Brigham Young would be oh, like the Miscavige figure. Yeah. The ruthless, uh, isn't, CEO who Shelley takes his over. Wife? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so this is an article that was in the New York Times in 1869. It's kind of remarkable how recent that is when you really think about it. 1869. It's not that long ago. And it's the New York Times. Anyway, uh, the sort of header is a daughter of Brigham Young attempts to elope. She is cruelly torn from her lover and restored to her parents. Um so this is what the uh, journalist wrote. Great efforts have been made to keep what I'm going to tell secret. I heard it pretty direct at the time, but doubted it. Since, however, I have received information sufficient to convince me that it is substantially true. It seems that the Mormon girls who have not yet got religion are very much opposed to polygamy. They had rather, so I think a lot, he's talking about like a lot of teenage girls, which mm. makes complete sense, right? Uh, they had rather spend an hour in the company of a congenial sinner, congenial? Than a year in that of a saint, especially if the former is young, holds his head high, head high and is good looking. There are occasionally 
such among the Gentiles, never among the Mormons. The girls call, mm, that's kind of. Uh, okay, well, you know that's anti-Mormon literature because I read a quote from Orson Pratt saying that the downfall of the Roman Empire and all countries that embrace monogamy, you find them feeble and eroded and mm. they eventually denigrate into sin. So you should check your sources on that. Well, that's all I'll say. this says the poor dear things talking about these teenage girls are very artless. And unless you have so delicate a respect for their helplessness as to withdraw your eyes, you cannot help seeing through and through them the same as you do through a window. Um, God, it was so Warren Jeffsy back then, especially once the political stuff kept kicked in and the whole thing was like, mind your own business. Like, don't talk to people mm. like the whole paranoia. Jeez, that would be such a weird time to live in. Suffice it that a likely young fellow whom for variety I will call John Smith became acquainted with Nabby, one of Brigham's daughters, and in course of time their intercourse ripened into true love. An elopement was planned, relays of horses stationed along the road, hence to you winter, I think that says, and about two weeks ago, in the latter hours of night, the streets rather deserted and darkness largely prevailing, the adventurous Swain drove slowly west with his buggy along South Temple Street, past the Royal Grounds, which were early closed that night for some reason, past Temple Block and still further westward. Four or five policemen issued from the vicinity of the tithing office and followed the buggy. Uh... Some of the words are hard to read because it's old newspaper articles. So when I'm tripping up, that's uh, probably why. When I'm doing this because I don't know how to read. It, yeah, sometimes it's that. It appears that Nabby was to meet John Smith three squares west of her father's corral and getting into the buggy. They were to fly on the wings of love to a land of liberty. Both had evidently been watched. And just as the girl was entering the buggy, the police appeared, chucked her into Brigham's carriage, which was unaccountably on hand. And having thus effectually clipped the aforesaid wings, either from policy or fear, allowed Smith to go about his business. In former times, he would undoubtedly have been killed without ceremony, but it would hardly do now. I wonder why it would hardly do now. Like in the past, Brigham would have killed. At this guy. point, there was enough fanfare about was. the Danites and the blood atonement stuff. Because mm. originally, you know, they're leaving the West in the middle of a war. Like they mm. didn't leave peacefully. They were like forcibly kicked out of the United States. And at that time, shit was just wild. And they, uh, that's around the time of Mountain Meadows and just hyper paranoia, vigilanteism. But then, you know, it's all cooking up in Washington and there's lawsuits and cases going to the Supreme Court. Blah, 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 blah. Utah's trying to become a state, but then the abandonment of polygamy uh, becomes a requirement. So there's um, more eyes on them now than there were exactly, before. Exactly, exactly. Um, okay. And the federal government has, all, at this point, sent troops to be like, well, this says that the guy, you know, who Brigham Young's daughter was in love with happened to be connected with people who could and would have made some trouble had he been assassinated. Mm. And then it goes on to say... Keep in mind, this is the culture where, uh, like, the bishop in Manti should get his name, but, uh, oh yeah, you know, saw a, a polygamist already, already had wives, saw a young woman in his congregation uh, going on with a young man. So he pulled the Joseph Smith trick, said, you're called to serve a mission. The guy said, nah, I'm going to marry this girl. And he said, yeah, the fuck right, you're going to jail. And then on the way to the jail, the bishop organizes a mob that takes the kid, castrates him, nails his balls to the schoolhouse door. Brigham Young catches wind, says, some are made eunuchs for the kingdom's sake. The old bishop is harsh, but he acted like right. Jared Halverson. Literally. <laughs> yeah. What are the this three is types the culture we're coming out of. <laughs> three times. You're never going to be a sister. There's actually three types. What questions do you have for me about the three types of eunuchs? <laughs> okay. Um, this article goes on to say, the girls have a secret society for helping each other away, saving up their money. Uh, the little traitors, God bless them. Brigham knows all about it and laughs at them, telling them that when they get religion, they will be ashamed of such foolishness. It makes an honest man's heart ache to see and know of such things and be powerless in the premises. The idea of girls in the first blush and blossom of womanhood. So we're talking about girls that are just hitting puberty. These are mm. young teenage girls. Um, 
the sweetest, most charming creatures on earth, frail as a flower, transparent as a trout bar. All right, New York Times. <laughs> in 1969. <laughs> Having a secret society, why such a man as Brigham can read their every thought, and that they should be driven to attempt it in self-defense is pitiful. With a woman, again, this is really revealing the time this was written in. With a woman, as we all know, one thing is everything, her purity. Without that, she had better <laughs> never have been. They actually had more in common with the Mormon. They're just yeah, like, again, 50 to 100 years ahead of Mormonism, as per usual. <laughs> uh, now, though they may themselves be as pure, be as pure the 20th wife as the first, Still, the opinion and custom and religion and law of their race, the net result of ages of experience, holds them neither more nor less than concubines in this plural marriage, to which every Mormon girl must look forward as her doom through all the days of her maidenhood. Lost, immolated, a human being with all its capacity for suffering or enjoying, fallen, ruined. We, anyway, uh, it's just going on and on about how terrible it is for Mormon girls and women in... Brigham Young's uh, Salt Lake, I guess. Mm -hmm. it, well, I mean, it's crazy. If you don't study history, you're bound to repeat it and all those cliches. You've always said that. I've always said it. I said it first. <laughs> Check the history books. <laughs> uh, it's just people have just such a vague, and in Mormonism, like an intentionally vague, because you try not to learn too much about it, because you have this lurking suspicion that it could unravel your whole faith as it has to multiple people that you know at this point. Um, but we have this murky ideas about history and the better you get a look at it, the more you're like, whoa, that is really, really mm -hmm. wacky. The I had Mormon, somewhere I was going with that, but I forgot. The Mormon apologists will be like, don't judge a polygamous Mormonism by today's standards. And it's like all the contemporary news sources are writing about it like this in a, in a really horrifying way. There were girls People trying to escape it. and they weren't allowed to escape. Oh. I mean, at the very minimum, you should be able to say, well, human trafficking is wrong. And so therefore, even if you think that these doctrines were true, people should still be free to come or go. And we should clarify that Mormon is, Mormons at this point were very, like literally pro-human trafficking. That mm -hmm. is, they were totally in favor of slavery. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I have to regale you with direct quotes from Brigham Young and all the rest about uh, black people and Native Americans and the curses and the reason that they were uh, made to be ugly to white people, as it says in the Book of Mormon. Um, it's like all just so bad. I think about Joseph Smith and like he with he was obviously bullshitting Egyptian, right? Like he could have written anything. No. He'd have been <laughs> no, not a chance. But he could have been like. And on the spaceship that uh, Elohim and his friends are on, they have all kinds of cool things. And little, he could have done like such cool world building. Yeah. But instead, he invented new scriptures about racism. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's how bad and backward Fresh. he was. Like rather than anything new or interesting, it was like actually let's drive home the racism a little bit more. Actually, black people are super super bad and totally deserve to be slaves. The subject of a lengthy theological treatise that he himself wrote, Brigham Young, they believed in literal chattel, chattel slavery. And so it's not a surprise that they also believed in the literal subjugation of women. He, he said like, this is your role. Do you realize that the first, like the person who was invent, like credited with being the forebearer of modern computing was a woman who was a contemporary of Brigham Young? Like at the time where Brigham Young was saying, women have no value outside of raising my children. And he said, I have I never love your wives so much that you couldn't leave one in it one moment without hesitation said, never love your wives like that. He wasn't like a romantic. He was just like, it's my will. You submit to it or be done. Telling them their only role is to raise my children and clean my house and make my food. That's it. Meanwhile, someone is laying the groundwork for modern, a woman is laying the groundwork for modern computing that we all benefit from today. Who was a prophet? Mm. Damn, um, You know how like polyamorous people often have a lot of love to give and that's like part of what draws them to polyamory yeah polygamy is like the opposite it's like these men yeah. that like cannot love a woman so they just like if they have a million who aren't allowed to complain mm -hmm. then they don't have to do any emotional labor they can just take the parts they can just exploit women you know take what they want and then they're gone for the night 
Um, this is a really, oh, for someone who asked what was the source I was just reading, that was from a New York Times article in 1869. We can post all the links in the box afterward. This is a really uh, short story, but John Taylor's daughter also tried to escape. This is also from the New York Times in 1879. And this is like a modern Keith Ranieri, or 100%. actually, uh, if you want a really, really good parallel to the Mormon experience, check out Wild Wild Country. Obviously, the like aesthetic trappings and some of the teachings are different, but the political religious dynamics are so interesting because we just don't have a lot of instances in these days of like thousands of people moving into a front frontier state en masse with like really disturbing as far as the rest of the culture is concerned, like sexual and relationship views and the conflicts that that creates and the bad acting on both sides, as well as some of the, like, you can empathize with both sides. Um, just a really, really fascinating mm. insight. Wild Wild Country, Netflix, one of the best docu series you can watch. Anyway, keep So going. New York Times, 1879 said, Josephine Taylor, 22 years old, or it might, I think it says 23, 22 or 23. A daughter of the president of the Mormon church attempted to escape from Utah and her father's harem. How do you say harem? Har harem. Yesterday. How do I say it? How you should say, I say it? You could say harem. 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 Yeah, harem sounds yeah. right for you. <laughs> harem. She got on the Union Pacific train, but having no ticket or money was put off at the first station east. She endeavored to get the agent at Uinta to secrete her. He refused, and her father's friends being given notice, she was taken back to Salt Lake today. Imagine if Russell M. Nelson's daughter like attempted to escape. It, yeah. I mean, it's not just Mormonism because it's like you're living in a theocracy, so it's a bigger deal than just leaving Mormonism. It's like the the town that he controls. Like he has way more power than Russell M. Nelson has. But it's like pretty telling that two. I mean, there could have been more daughters of other prophets that tried to escape too. I, these are just two that I happen to find, but it's pretty telling when two of the daughters of these men who were the prophet trying to escape. And that they went and brought them back. Yeah. This, this is like literal Scientology shit. Yeah, a 22 year old. I mean, I'm, I always try and think in my little apologist brain and I'm like, maybe Brigham Young's daughter in that last story was like still a minor. Not that they really give a shit about you being a minor and getting mm. married. So really she should be allowed to go off with her lover, whatever her age was, because it was a different time back then. People got married during the <laughs> But um, this is like a 22 year old woman. So yeah. Ugh. Ah, yeah. Um, so there was this one piece, a very harrowing. These are all very harrowing. I didn't know that about the prophet's daughters. Mm -hmm. That's a first yeah, one me for neither. me. Me neither. Um, this uh, escape from Salt Lake. This is basically a guy who I think the writer of this piece. I think it's a journalist. Uh, this is from the Liberty Weekly Tribune in 1882. I've never heard of that, but um, this journalist is basically talking about his experience observing uh, like new Mormon immigrants getting off the boat or whatever the experience, you know, like coming in to, uh, I can't remember if it's. <laughs> Parachuting into Salt Lake. <laughs> Basically it's a writer in the New York Observer uh, talking about things in Mormondom as they called it. Should I go straight into this or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you guys all for being here. We have way more on our stream than we normally do. It's because um, we plugged it in advance. We never do that. Uh, yeah. um, we are taking super chats and you can also Venmo us if you don't want YouTube to take a third of the money and we'll read out Venmo super chats the same. So this is what this journalist has to say. Not many months ago when in Utah, I witnessed the arrival of a herd of raw Mormon converts fresh from peasant homes in Sweden and Wales. It was late in the afternoon on a hot dry Jul July day. The railway station. Okay. They're getting off the train. The is there trains in Utah? Yeah, yeah. That was one of the first. In fact, oh. uh, this is the subject of the film, The Mountain of the Lord, uh, about the building of the Salt Lake Temple, how church power or, you know, the the church builder colony machine was diverted from building the temple toward building the railroad so that oh. they could build, you know, bring in resources. So, yeah, they, they helped build the Transcontinental Railroad. That Rail, that train that used to go by our old apartment was that was that the... <laughs> built by Brigham Young. Did Brigham Young build that railroad? <laughs> yeah. That's where we fucking. That's why I had it. dark, I had dark yeah, energy. Did have dark energy. <laughs> it's so fucking loud. Um, <laughs> we were like, it's crazy how cheap our rent is. <laughs> <laughs> Every <laughs> night, the most heinous <laughs> sounds you've ever heard. Okay. Old old members of the channel remember. <laughs> the, yeah, the sounds it would the happen in the videos all the time. Okay, yeah. back when we filmed uh, on the bed. Yeah. 
we've grown up so much since then. We have House a, finds us so a, a, we now. have chairs now. <laughs> Behold the symbols of our power. <laughs> This guy goes on to say, the railway station was surrounded by perhaps a thousand gabbling women, children and men, curiously peering into the faces of the newcomers, most of whom were unable to understand more than a few words of English. Uh, they were fair-cheeked, flaxen-haired girls and brawny-armed but gawkish young Swedish farmers oh, and God. were all marched from the station to the great courtyard of the tithing house. I keep hearing about the tithing house in a lot of these. I'm like, what the was the tithing, tithing house? I've never even heard of it. Oh, I'm guessing they're taking them to the tithing house because they have to immediately hand over all their ten percent of their. To, well, yeah. no, it wouldn't have been. It probably would have been all their belongings back then, wouldn't it? Uh, or, no, there was only some communities at that point that were like full of consecration. So, like mm -hmm. Orderville, Utah, is an example of one of those. But I don't think the general membership <laughs> was in like full consecration at this point. I'm hearing a weird sound, but it's just something Cat check. Everybody yeah. check your cats real quick. Everybody good? <sighs> okay. So, uh, no person was allowed admission, but the few fagged out missionaries, I'm not really sure what that Sorry, means. Sorry, what? <laughs> fagged out, phrase from the 1800s, uh, who had brought Zion this new importation together with some of the more prominent church rulers. Here in the tithing yard, surrounded by a lofty, somber stone wall, like the fortified enclosure of a military prison or state arsenal, the ro you'll notice a pattern in all of these <laughs> accounts from the time. Uh, the role of, and it makes sense, right? Because anyone who sees like what Warren Jess is doing, we're like, that is a prison, that is a, like a slave camp almost, you know, like we, we have these same impressions now when we see this type of thing. And sometimes I feel like apologists of Mormonism have this idea that, you know, if you go back in time, I don't know, just by virtue of it being 200 years ago, like everything was fine and people uh, didn't, but it's like people weren't down for that either. Like, uh, anyway, uh, so like the fortified enclosure of a military prison, the role of recruits was certified, personal effects inspected and preparations made to forthwith distribute the babes as the old Mormons called the new immigrants, emigrants. Then they were all marched again down the broad... The babes. Is it all the chads in Salt Lake City are like, all right, time to sort the babes. Our broady babes. Well, I do think... Our um, faggish boys and broad babes. The impression I got from most of these is that they would they would more often be women who are coming over than men. Mm -hmm. But they would bring some men and apparently they would immediately be given a gun. And like the role of any new man was to basically just like be part of their militia. Like it was like every woman is to become a sex slave and every man is to become a soldier. A soldier, yeah. We are all enlisted till the conflict is o'er and it's never ending. Never. I can't wait for you to get your frosted tips. Just a side Thank note, you. but Thank just you. I'm gonna be as I watch you perform so handsomely, just imagining <laughs> the impact frosted tips would make. If anyone wants to frost my tips for free, <laughs> please volunteer. <laughs> okay, so then. Uh, they were all marched again down the broad main street in a most motley procession to a place where, as it seemed to me, a very ungenerous supply of provisions was spread, which I judged by the familiar odor to consist chiefly of salt eod fish. It's like EOD fish as one word. I'm not sure what that is, if anyone knows. Uh, it also could be like a weird, uh, the fact that it's an old newspaper. Here for an hour or two, the rigid surveillance of the church was relaxed and intercourse was permitted with relations and friends who had long before come over by aid of the church emigration fund. That's interesting that it said that for an hour or so, the rigid surveillance of the church was relaxed. That's kind of chilly. Just that idea that when new recruits come into the cult, you, you put on a good face at first because you don't want to immediately spook them off, right? Mm. Late and again, they... They're like basically at war with the United States. Like mm. it's really intense there. That's why they had to bring over Swedish farm boys. Yeah. Soldiers Strong and wives. Strapping tall lads. Late in the evening, the new converts were put into camp in a vacant lot. Oh, Marcus said codfish. Maybe that's what it was. That sounds right. <laughs> um, where the young Mormon athletes had played a champion game of baseball with the Cheyenne red stockings and where they might rest their jaded bodies on the hard bare ground under the coverlid of the stars. 
I guarantee Brigham wasn't sleeping on the cold, hot ground that night. Oh, no. I mean, when the Martin and Willie Handcart company were coming across, he sent men to rescue them. But first, he sent people to go get his provisions and bring them back before rescuing the people. Just um, a little factoid. Well, I think this next sentence is talking about that. So when new women would enter uh, Utah, there was it was a big deal, like who's going to get what woman? And, you know, like the higher up, uh, men in the church would would get to have their first pick of the women. There was like infighting between church leaders for like taking. Uh, there's that one quote of some Caberson leader Kimball. saying like, "You guys have been taking the prettiest ones for yourselves first. And and Brigham Young explicitly saying that people with more keys were allowed to encourage. They could take a, another person's wife. Essentially, not that a wife is a commodity that you can take, but you know what I mean. Well, it was here. <laughs> it was here. Exactly. So they're sleeping on the hard ground under the coverlet of stars. Here too, the sentinels were posted. And what's a sentinel? Is that like a guard? A watch person. Uh, yeah. So they're immediately going into like a, a very North Korea system. It's probably system. something like that, yeah. Um, and only some of the more favored bishops who had a first choice of the flesh pots were allowed entrance. So probably some of the higher up dudes were allowed to kind of go in and see and scope out the... Oof. Oh, I just saw a podcast about uh, Mormonism's first uh, brothels. I meant to give it a listen because mm. I was like, oh. Never. By good luck, I induced a friendly guardsman to let me within, interloper as I was. It was a glorious midsummer night, the mellow moon at its full, and the stars giving forth lustrous light reflected through the rarefied Rocky Mountain atmosphere. I appreciate the, the poeticness <laughs> in an otherwise horrible piece. Uh, away over the valley, the lofty peaks and sharply defined shadows of the mountain ranges were penciled almost as clearly as if the earth had not drawn about herself, her dusky Some, mantle of slumber. Something we all, all of us across every spectrum presented here can appreciate is Utah's mountains. Yeah, Spectacular. Come on. Some were, and I, and if you, he was probably doing that to create contrast between. Mm. Some were met. Oh, here and there reposed groups of the wearied out voyagers gazing in wonder on the weird moonlight panorama. Some were merrily chatting together in their native tongue, others sobbing aloud as if their poor hearts would break. And so, yeah, because I don't know that they necessarily, I, I don't, from what I've read, they didn't really know they were going into such a like intense environment where there's going to be like guards around with guns. And, totally. And so suddenly they're like, they're just being corralled into this, like totally. wherever they are. And they're like, all right, sleep on the ground now that you've given us your stuff. Ooh, yeah. Um, in another aspect is, yeah, your the political dimensions of acquiring new people. Like it makes total sense why Mormon, Mormonism is a proselyting re religion because there was just an, initially that huge need to like get as many people there so that you can have it, voters on your side. Yep, build it's, shit. Yep. Make every, I mean, yeah, everything functions on labor exploitation. <laughs> and this, everything was built on the back of someone's exploited labor, it seems. <laughs> Starting from Joseph Smith's very first treasure digging days where he's like, I got a revelation. You just got to go dig over there and I'm going to keep praying and doing my little, playing with my little spells. Just kidding. You fucked up. <laughs> you, so you messed up. You, you weren't paid You give me your money, but we didn't find the treasure. Uh, I find all this so interesting. Like articles from the New York Times from the time. I just think that's like the most fascinating look back. And it's not someone even talking with the kind of like vitriol you expect no, from the 1800 like, papers. It's I like, saw. this is what I saw. Because yeah. <laughs> well, some of the 1800s ones are so flowery and, you know. So it says, uh, others sobbing aloud as if their poor hearts would break, and some demurely giving heed to what seemed to my eavesdropping ears to be a mixture of love talk and religious catechizing. Yeah, like catechism. Uh, By the bishops. The what does that mean? Like kind of instructing on catching them up on the doctrine and scheme of oh, things. I like, wonder what love talk the rules. means. Like, does that mean like trying to win over the girls? Yeah, we love you. Oh, okay. Um, God <clears throat> loves you. Welcome. Okay. Uh, each Here's of oh the God. Rules, submit. <laughs> yeah, so saying, talking about the bishops, each of whom would take one after another of these foreign maidens singly under his charge and endeavor to reconcile her to the destiny already fixed for each. So yeah, the bishops were being allowed in to be like, what girls do you want? Oh, the shepherd. Ew. Ew, 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 ew. And you're vulnerable ew. as, you know, you're like, as a young single woman. They're just speaking English, some of these girls. Yeah, and, and these are the men that are in charge of this new system that you didn't know you were coming into. 
It was indeed difficult to resist the impression that we were wandering with unbidden feet about the scene of a peculiar slave mart. Peculiar, sorry, I said that weird. Of a peculiar slave mart, like the bazaars in Constant Constantinople, where choice young Caucasian girls Caucasian. are auctioned. No, oh. but maybe it was in old spelling. Probably. Are auctioned off to smoky mouthed old pasbas, just as these fresh young Swedish virgins were being parceled out among the Mormon saints. The truth was, and it, this is so chilling in line with the stuff, the other stuff I've read where it's like the girls in particular were encouraged to emigrate. Mm. And there was also accounts of like, uh, like in Europe, for example, where it was usually especially pretty girls that were going to Utah. Flirt to convert, baby. This truth was baby. soon proved. Oh, Oof. This truth Cursed. was soon proved for a day or two after I learned from an unquestionable source that a certain bishop, after a long wrangle with one of his envious associates, had succeeded for a compensation in recapturing two of the likeliest girls, one to be introduced as the new favorite and fourth wife in his Salt Lake home, and the fifth to be placed over a new household in a brand new log cabin in St. Pete, San Pete. These poor, forlorn girls had cried long and pitifully, not because of their special fate as polygam polygamic wives, remarked a Mormon shopkeeper, but out of womanly trepidation and mere nervous excitement, he said. It was just like, oh, it's normal for the women to just sob uncontrollably when they find out that they have to become <laughs> a fifth wife and they weren't told about polygamy before they come. That's just their womanly ways. That's, Brigham Young, they all hate it. Polygamy. They do hate it, but they need to suck it up. They hate it. They need to suck it up. <laughs> Uh, who knows the secret recesses of a woman's heart surely however such scenes as these are not uncommon in salt lake it is said that dickens prejudiced drew an impossible jew in fagan and dickens apologetic produced an equally unjewish ryab without either prejudice or apology i have pictured the real mormon damn scary I mean, and it, makes perfect sense when you like read everything song. they ever said and did. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, we talked in the Tim Ballard video about, like, some, well, the 19th wife, what's her name? Yeah. Said uh, okay. that Mormon polygamy was a system worse than African slavery. And we pushed back on that and we're like, well, it's not worse, but like, we understand the sentiment. Mm. But, but this guy describing that scene as a slave mart, I'm like, that's exactly what it is. It's like all these new fresh meat coming in the higher up bishops coming in and deciding what women they want. I know we're hopping on about this, but it's just like, that's so human trafficking. Mm -hmm. Like that's like, and I, I would still say that it was worse that, uh, no, yeah, yeah. I'm not, we don't yeah, need yeah, to be. Yeah. yeah. But that's a different, but this but is saying, literal but, human trafficking. <laughs> no, but like simply it's calling it akin trafficking. to a slave mart. I mean, a slave mart it doesn't is. mean Africa. He didn't. Right. 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 It is mention. a sex slave. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, a yeah. sex slave mart. Which is, again, why the Republican National Convention was like, this is the worst shit going on in America. <laughs> yeah. God bless the Republicans. So spooky. <sighs> Should we talk about the uh, Indian placement program? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, aside from Black-oriented racism enshrined multiple times, some in new, unique ways, unique to Mormonism, it said that the things that are unique to Mormonism aren't necessarily good, and the things that are good to Mormonism are definitely not unique. And here is one of those unique things to Mormonism that is not good, and that is uh, spe special racist teachings about both Black people as being descendants of Cain and fence leaders in the pre-mortal realm and all that. We also have a bunch of bunk-ass teachings about Native Americans that were first propagated in the Book of Mormon by Joseph Smith. Of course, he gathered myths that were being told at the time and just kind of spun his version of it, which is that uh, Native Americans are essentially Jews, Israelites, who came here, who were white until they became wicked, and then God cursed them with a dark skin so that they would be ugly to the Nephites. That is literally... What it says, I mean, not word for word, but it's literally that made them unattractive to the white people. Hide in my doorway. Um, have you noticed that our lighting is really washed out? Um, and I wonder if that light should we try is it? making it worse. Yeah, I'd just be curious. Hey, 
Hi, Jared. We're in the middle of a live stream. Main channel live stream. If you want to say hi, you can. Now it feels really washed up. Talking about side. human trafficking and early Mormonism is really fun. I that seems better, doesn't it? Yeah, that's less washed out. Sure. It's hard to tell. Um. <clears throat> so anyway, like, uh, the like eugenics e vision of Mormonism is rooted in this idea that the Native Americans need to be converted. To Mormonism, that that's like one of its primary purposes, the and the Americans. purpose that the Book of Mormon itself serves is to convert the Native Americans and to make them white, and so that was to be done by forceful assimilation and interbreeding, like literally breeding the color out to make them more white and delightsome, and that was something that Spencer W. Kimball, up until the seventies, was saying, like they're getting whiter, we're doing good. <laughs> It seems so unnecessarily myopic to, for Joseph to have said that the primary function of the Book of Mormon was to convert the Native Americans. But when you think that in the area he grew up in, like every the buzz was always about like these Indian mounds and what mm -hmm. are they? And, and the Book of Mormon is in line with like one of the dominant theories at that time, right? Like it really wasn't anything groundbreaking. But it's like in Joseph Smith's world, that, that those were like the central other in his mm -hmm. like us versus yeah, totally. them stories. So like to us now, and we're like, that's so niche because this is a global church. And like, why would you be so stupid as to say that it was just to convert? Anyway. American religion. Yeah. It's so perfect. Almost too perfect. Um, so yeah, Mormons have always had a really, really messed up relationship with Native Americans. And in, in one of those ways where it's like, it is complex because sometimes they're merciful or, you know, can enter into exchanges, but always from the fucked up premise that they are better, mm -hmm. this whole imposed view about their origins and destiny and all the acts wherein the white Mormon settlers have all the power, they're literally holding them at gunpoint, they get to set the terms of negotiations, uh, are doing, you know, so it's like, oh yeah, sometimes they were nice, but then other times you get things like, Brigham Young saying, and I quote, and this isn't, you know, like an anti-Mormon site. This is the Utah Historical Quarterly Journal um, where Brigham Young wrote, I advised them to buy up the Lamanite children as fast as they could. So as far as God's children not being for sale. They're both for sale and Brigham's advertising buying. the Brigham fact that Brigham is and advertising. Encouraging. I advised them to buy up the Lamanite children as fast as they could and educate them and teach them the gospel so that many generations would not pass ere they would become a white and delightsome people and said that the Lord could not have devised a better plan than having put us where we were in order to accomplish this thing. Utah Historical Quarterly, uh, seven, page six. Why does it often feel like hyper-religious people are often prone to adopting and... It's like we all want to have this view of people who adopt as like, that's great. You know, you're mm. providing a home to a kid that, that then doesn't have to be in the foster care system. But it feels like so often uh, the American adoption system is also especially weird, right? Because you, you, there's some, the, like money is involved. And anyway, oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's one thing. of the big criticisms. It's like you, yeah. uh, you're essentially you purchasing are buying children. A child, yeah. And the fact that you can like buy children from other countries. Anyway, um, where was I going As with this? As we'll get into. Where was I going with that point? Oh, it, it just feels like so often the like religious tendency to adopt does come from this like savior complex, superiority complex yes. thing. It feels especially icky when it's like a black or brown child from another culture and they're mm. like, we need to, you know, I mean, I mean, the, the church leaders at this time were literally teaching that they the children would become white. Yes. Like that's how much that the... the the, the church is obviously now trying to walk back like the skin of blackness as something, you know, uh, racist, Abhorrent but it's like, it that's weird then that they would teach that the kids would become white if they got more right, which is obviously the fucking plot of the Book of Mormon. So and like and from it. the beginning, like, into, like, marrying them was a Joseph Smith, Martin Harris kind of thing. Like, go out and take you squaws of the natives and, mm -hmm. or of the Indians, as they called them. And, uh, so that was very much on their mind from the beginning. Brigham Young told them to buy Native Amer American children. Elsewhere, he said, I say go and kill them. Let the women and children live if they behave themselves. 
We have no peace it's until the men the are Bible. killed off. Never treat the Indian as your equal. That's oh. from the Historian's Office General Church Minutes, 1839. The Christ within him, wide awake. Never treat the Native American as your equal. I mean, this like, is this from... This is a Jesus religion? <laughs> Fuck off. This is from the man who said the way to truly love and what Jesus meant when he said love your brother as yourself Stick is that if you him. see <laughs> them committing adultery, you throw a javelin through okay. their heart. That is true love. But it's not adultery if you have more priesthood keys. That's true. Then that that's is a whole true. different thing. Different thing. If a woman does it, gotta be killed that classic thing though if he was like condemning other men if you see another man doing the very thing that i myself do constantly <laughs> kill him it's like trump being like anyone who's uh found guilty of human trafficking or sex sexually exploiting children death penalty and it's like you're guilty of both those things yeah very telling yeah exactly that you proclaim the loudest <laughs> ah! okay so uh yeah, so the church has all kinds of fucked up relationships with the Native Americans. We're just coming up. Um, we just passed last month was the anniversary of the Circleville Massacre, mm. the largest unprovoked slaughter of innocent Native Americans in Utah history, where a group of settlers were feeling really paranoid about uh, Native attacks and things. And it's like, sure, they're... They, I would be afraid if I were a settler then too, but also begs the question, why am I going into someone else's land and trying to set up shop there and telling them they're not allowed to live there? You're like, yeah, I ought to be afraid because I'm being an idiot. Um, so, but there's a lot of paranoia going around. They capture this group of women and children who they know are friendly. It was a friendly tribe, a cooperative. They intertraded and things, but they were like, oh, that sentiment is so intense right now that we can't let them go. They took mm. them into the church house and there they slit their throats. The women and children? Yes. Uh, so three children managed to escape. The two boys were sold. And the and uh, the ones that escaped said that they watched her be swung by her heels against a wagon wheel until she died. Oh, my God. So This isn't anti-Mormon stuff. This is in historical journals. Circleville Massacre. And that is also, like, the, the wheel thing. Mm -hmm. That's, like going it's i mean obviously all so far beyond self-protection but i'm like that's like cruelty like someone's getting off on torturing a child at that point which is like that is how war goes like war puts people in an ultra violent yeah. ultra predatory state and it has always been accompanied by the worst like sexual aggression because it's like it's all just allowed there if, if killing and it's just all allowed there I have to pee. I'll be so quick. Um, do you want me to? Well, yeah, you can keep going. I can hear you. Comment. I'll read super chats as they funnel in while you're in the bathroom. We're taking a quick commercial break. Hi, welcome to our commercial break. My name is Tanner. I'll be leading the commercial break, reading all our super chats from all our friendly donors who are calling in at this very moment. We've got a Venmo. Unfortunately, it needs Sam's face ID to open the phone. <laughs> you want me to yell that? What is it? I can't hear it now. All right. I got it. I got it. All right. Cool, cool, cool. Thank you so much. We're, oh my God, your home screen is a nightmare. Where the fuck is anything? Um, Christopher Egged. Is that how you pronounce your name? Love your channel. Thank you for being a constant source of validation. You know what? You're welcome, Christopher. This is validation particularly for you. You're doing great. You're killing it in practically every aspect of your life. Sure, you could do a little bit better in some places, but that's what we love about you is that you recognize it and you're always working on yourself. You're a better person today than you were yesterday, than you were yesterday, and that's why we all look up to you. Christopher, thank you for sending $20. Thanks, Christopher. Now we're back. That's so oh, nice. Oh, Annette. Annette, you what? Juiced. Oh, we know. We. We know. The Knights of Me should never. Hello. Hi. <sighs> are we still on the Knights oh, of American Children? Yeah, we are. Okay, so um, in the 1950s, the church started what they called the Indian Placement Program. The idea was it was going to assimilate Native American children into white culture. And there's an aspect that's like, okay, the Native Americans who are living on the reservations are doing in like abject poverty, like third world conditions um, where they don't have access to resources, to um, different things that they might enjoy. And it's so fucked up because civilized society. The fucking 
like colonialists themselves will use that as a justification of like so clearly they're savages and it's like you are the people that like ravaged their yes exactly like when the u.s goes in and destabilizes another country right. and then they use the poverty and terribleness of that country to be like see it's actually fine for us to take that oil so <laughs> they're killing our soldiers because they're terrorists <laughs> why are our soldiers there <laughs> um yeah so you they create this problem and then solve it by okay, forceful assimilation, and in some ways it helps them. And there are people who look back on that program and said, that was really great. It gave me an opportunity the to Indian get educated. program? Yeah, it gave me a uh, mm -hmm. chance to be educated. So to relative, be isn't it? Yeah. But then a bunch of people were like, yeah, because I was separated from my family and I wasn't allowed to speak my native tongue, they were like literally had their mouths washed out with soap or were beaten mm -hmm. if they spoke Navajo. Um, it was illegal to do any uh, Navajo or any Native American religious ceremonies. If they did, the ones that have been preserved have literally been done in secret. How telling is that that they the Mormons until like the and 70s. others were so threatened by an alternate religious ceremony? It just goes to show like the fragility of their. Because if you really thought you had the best stuff. You'd be like, yeah, do your dinky little thing. Like, we'll be here doing our way cooler thing. But it's like, no, you on some level can see that they have a richer culture than yours. And mm. no, you know, it's it's interesting because sometimes I feel shame for like still talking about Mormonism, both from not so much from Mormons. I used to feel that way, and then I'm like, no, fuck it, whatever, and kind of claim my power there. But from like some people outside who don't have a real like, why are you still talking about this thing? It's like. Mormonism is a uniquely fascinating religion mm -hmm. where like American white nationalism is like the a fundamental tone where patriarchy is literally enshrined. Like the word patriarchal order mm -hmm. is like the thing and that they founded a whole ass state. Mm -hmm. What an interesting like microcosm of America. And we nearly had a Mormon president. Yeah, it I is mean, like very, very interesting and very pertinent microcosm. to like everything that's going on in America. Also, I, I don't think it's strange at all to still be talking about, I mean, it's like when you discover an area where you can have impact, where you have personal experience, where you're able to relate to the experiences of people who are like suffering or, or trying, you know, trying to leave, like oh, it makes complete sense to still be talking about Mormonism. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean that Mormonism is like the dominant focus of your life, mm -hmm. but it like, people don't ask historians, like, why are you so uniquely focused on this one <laughs> period of Japanese history? It's like, that's just kind of what caught that's my attention. <laughs> uh, we're kind of in a new world now where like infotainment is now a, a genre and, and a thing. And like people uh, do learn from it and, I don't know. I'm like, where A, you have a lot, like a great ability to help because of your personal experiences, but also like, it's just, yeah, like you said, really fascinating and you have a personal connection to it. Oh, Desmond Nizand Nato says, I feel so sorry for this new generation. So brainwashed. I'm sorry that you see the acquisition of new information as brainwashing. I'm sorry that you can't handle change. I'm sorry that the generations before you didn't teach you how to adapt to those kind of things. You deserved better. Thought control strategies have been employed by powerful people in every generation throughout history. And so it's not not true that there are people who are brainwashed in 2023, like of various different flavors, obviously, but uh, it's it's certainly not a new phenomenon. Like if anything, the f before information was more democratized through the internet, like, you know, you could be born in, in Mormonville in, in Salt Lake City in the 1800s and you had no, your brain could not even conceptualize a reality outside of that. Like it's not, so going back in time, people were probably a lot more brainwashed. And, and again, if you like, most uh, empires throughout history have been like very authoritarian or like most nations, like most people throughout history or like civilized history have lived in under some form of authoritarianism. So there's a massive amount of brainwashing that's been like part of that through the whole, it's just like absurd to think that like the modern generation is more brainwashed. Right. <laughs> it's simply not because true. Because statistically In more educated. More yeah. <laughs> and there are, there are certainly like new means by which we can be, uh, you know, controlled by powerful people. Like for example, the right wing propaganda, let's just give one example. We don't have to make it right or left, but it's like, uh, there are new types of media now that allow for different types of brainwashing and like maybe more insidious, brain I don't know, but it's just, yeah. Anyway, let's get Jim back Jared. to- Hi Jared, do you want to go for that? a run? 
going to the gym. Say hello to all your adoring fans. Hi, adoring fans. Um, hope these guys are being good to you. Peace. Good luck. And that was our CEO with another <laughs> inspiring message. Um, so this is an article from Business Insider. Uh, the headline is, in the 1950s, thousands of Native American children were placed in Mormon homes for racial assimilation. Now experts fear an upcoming Supreme Court ruling could allow that to happen again. So in January 2018, Chad and Jennifer Brackeen adopted a Navajo baby boy, winning a legal battle with the Navajo Nation after it sought to place the boy with a Navajo family. Soon after, the Texas couple looked to adopt his younger sister, but ran into more opposition. The girl's extended family wanted to take her in too. The Brackeens again took things to court, suing to overturn an act that gives preference to native families in child custody proceedings. The case has wound Wait, up- Wait, as in like their own families? Yeah, so these are kids uh, are being adopted and their own families, extended families are like, we can take care of them, let's keep them here. And the, this white family is from Texas is now suing the Navajo Nation saying, because they're saying this is racial discrimination essentially against white people to adopt native Navajo it's children. It's familial discrimination. It's like any time a kid's parents can't look after them, it, we always go first to the aunts, uncles, grandparents. Like that's... But if Native Americans are just... But the superiority complex, yeah. It's, it's just that belief that like because we're white, we're fundamentally better equipped to raise these kids who Chrissy, have been born in a culture that we don't understand whatsoever. <sighs> what were you going to say? just how uh, Joseph Smith in his uniquely racist teachings also like went as far as to say that the Native Americans were lazy. Like that's how mm -hmm. that they were depicted in the Book of Mormon, the Lamanites. And Very that's classic. still something that they, that I have heard <coughs> many Mormons. I grew up ne right next to the Navajo reservation. Like I, some big population of my school was Navajo and I always heard that kind of stuff. I'm famously life. very lazy, despite having had uh, many me opportunities too. in life. But do you know what will make me more lazy is feeling like I have no upward mobility in society because my entire community has just been thwarted by colonialism. Yep. Is colonialism the right word? Yeah, truly. Okay. Yeah, settler colonialism for sure. Uh, so this case went up, wound its way up to the highest court in America. This fall, the Supreme Court is reconsidering the Indian Child Welfare Act of 1978. That's the year that the church officially extend the priesthood to all worthy males. Sorry. So this act that um, prioritized um, native families being able to keep their kids, mm -hmm. that was just passed by the U S in general. It was enacted after studies in 1969 and 1974 showed that 25 to 30%, 35% of all native children were separated from their families and placed into foster homes, adoptive Ugh. homes or institutions. Which wouldn't have been better in so many cases. I mean, there's right. endless heartbreaking stories from that fucking system. Right. So this is that, it like... And didn't Tim Ballard say in his uh, little uh, interview that, that part of the pedophile playbook is to separate kids, kids from, from their, their families. families? Well, guess what? We have endless Native American children saying that they were sexually abused because they were separated from their families. And right, then... because predators... It's they're looking for people who are vulnerable and who's more vulnerable, don't have like someone who don't have, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's why Joseph Smith sent young girls, minors, dads on missions. Lucy Walker Smith, yeah. her mom had died, sent her dad on a mission. He's like, Hey, come on, you'll be my adopted daughter. I'll take care of her, she's my adopted daughter. Hi, I would like to marry you. Um. So the studies also revealed that 85% of all Native American children in foster care were living in non-Indian homes, even when they had fit and willing relatives. Ugh. The like rate that's so the Tim Ballard thing, like when people like we have a bunch of people in our comments being like, how could this be racist? And granted, like we only just touched on the racial issues, not even necessarily in connection to Tim Ballard, but in human trafficking questions generally. And people were like, oh, how could you say he's racist? Which we didn't say. Oh, he literally has adopted black kids. And it's like, yeah, but when you're going into another country, breaking their laws, uh, causing children who were not being trafficked prior to be trafficked so that you can bust their parents under the guise of, oh, I'm just going to go get all the bad guys who are willing to sell their kids into slavery, bringing them back, and then having them grow up in a situation where they're disconnected from their parents, who have people who are now exploiting them for tons of money to use their image as like, oh, look what I'm doing. I'm this hero. And then you- like And now they're vulnerable. And I'm not saying that Tim is abusing his kids. I'm not saying that 
the kids who are being rescued are necessarily being abused, but there is a long history of this kind of shit happening in Mormonism. Yeah. And you could just as easily say that about uh, the Mormons who adopted these uh, Native American kids. Like, how could you possibly say they're racist when they adopt the And it's like, exactly. it's the superiority complex. Yes. Like, for example, like the fact that they go to, the OUR will go to other countries to do these raids because in the US their raids would be illegal because they don't follow any kind of procedure. There's no regular, like they're not, I mean, we in that video explored stories of them just like doing whatever the fuck they feel like doing in the moment, which like uh, for something as sensitive as like allegedly rescuing kids from human trafficking, you should never just be like flying by the city. Guns blazing, yeah. like, led by a psychic. <sighs> but what, why was I saying that? I don't know. Okay, so this this article goes on to talk about how this is all um, the church, the Indian placement program done by the church in the 50s um, is sort of this cultural genocide, this uh, idea that you need to breed out mm. um, a, a culture's DNA, breed out their and their genetic markers like their skin, as well as forbid them from speaking their language or practicing their culture in any way. Literal genocide. Um, so... Ooh, oh, we're, yeah, let's get the battery. Whoa, the practice, this says in 1850, California passed a law that allowed white settlers to take in Indian children as indentured servants, oh. something that Mormons were also Wait, doing. Wait, when? What year? This is in 1850s. This oh, is my God. Brigham Young era. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the U.S. government paid states and religious groups to run Indian boarding schools where we know there was a shit ton of sexual yeah. abuse. That sought to eliminate traditional American Indian culture and where they found like tons of bodies of buried children. Mm. Um, like the Irish orphanages. Yeah. Uh, many Native Americans recalled torture and hatred at these schools, according to the AP. Both the government and religious groups employed rhetoric of benevolence to justify their attempts at assimilation, according to Jacobs. It was always the rhetoric of the poor India needs to be saved from the impoverished reservation. Ironically, all the impoverishment was a result of colonization. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, he goes in talking about the Mormon history of racism, all the scriptures that talk about black skin being a sign of God's displeasure and how they, Brigham Young advocated for purchasing Native Americans. Um, also then educating them in the 50s with the Indian placement program. Oh, geez. This was Spencer W. Kimball's particular baby. He was, like, very upset with it. And they, like, Ezra Taft Benson. Obsessed it was one with of it the, or upset with it? Obsessed with it. He, did, he was, like, very much a fan of this program. Mm -hmm. And, like, like two days after he died or something like that, like, within a very short time, Ezra Taft Benson was like, that's gone. That's We're true. not Mormons anymore. <laughs> Um, critics of Mormon's program argued that taking children away from their families harmed Native American culture, amounting to cultural colonialism, even genocide. Um, yeah. It really alienated a lot of Native American children from, uh, to be taken from their families and their cultures. You hear about children returning to the families for the summer and feeling out of place. Mm. If they're being punished for speaking their own language or enjoying their... Yeah. Like, taught to see their their people as bad, literally rewiring bad. yeah because you know a lot of brainwashing i mean speaking of brainwashing you know a lot of brainwashing went into getting them to assimilate to a culture that wasn't theirs. also um a great way to facilitate sexual abuse especially in families that are separated from their parents is if they haven't learned english and you're not allowing them to speak navajo mm. then you're not allowing them to communicate about which problems abuse. that they're facing which is literally straight up abuse abuse um thank you kimberly for the super chat uh they write the indian program of the church isn't uniquely bad check out the residential school system of canada if you want to find out about the worst atrocities committed against indigenous peoples yeah yeah for sure this is definitely like indicative of the climate at the time and like we said mormonism is interesting because it's sort of this microcosm of these bigger uh trends that are playing out nationally mm. and in some ways globally um in 2016, four Native Americans who had participated in the program sued the LDS Church, alleging sexual abuse. One of the plaintiffs, who goes by the pseudonym RJ, was 10 years old when he was allegedly sexually molested by his stepbrother. RJ also suffered physical, emotional, and cultural abuse by his foster mother, including having his mouth washed out with soap whenever he spoke Navajo to the placement children in the home. 
according to the complaint. RJ was moved to two other foster homes, but was again sexually abused, the complaint alleged. Again, if you're like, we're rescuing children, we don't have a plan other mm -hmm. than, well, we just got to put them into a foster home or get someone to adopt mm -hmm. them. You haven't necessarily saved them from exploitation in some ways. You've made the, put them in even greater danger. That again, going back to this wasn't happening before until you gave your the parents the devil's deal. Um, so it, it goes on pretty much in that fashion. It's so this was in the fifties earlier than that, much, much, much scarier. Um, cause remember Mormons are being encouraged to take native American ch children to buy native American children, to keep them as indentured servants in the same way that they were keeping literal black slaves. Um, someone posted yesterday on pioneer day on Twitter about their ancestor. Get this. This is from Collab and Peace. Here's a story of my pioneer ancestor, Joseph Murdoch. He abducted a Shoshone girl named Sekinup and raised her as his daughter, the old Joseph Smith move. Yes. When she was 13, she started flirting with a boy her age. Murdoch was unhappy and married her as his fifth wife. Mm. That's the attitude that's yeah. going on in this region at mm. that time. Yeah, as all the articles said. Not like, a pretty these picture. These old creepy guys just, and it it seemed like it was a big problem. Like, and you see this in with Warren Jeff's uh, group as well. Like, when these uh, girls are approaching puberty and they start being interested in boys their age, it's so common for those boys to be kicked out of the community or killed or castrated. Or, you know, there has to be like a way to like keep all that in check to like maintain the power structures. Cause obviously like young girls are gonna be more attracted to people their age almost all of the time, not these creepy old dudes with 12 wives already. Mm -hmm. So like- Get the young men on the missions. Men are being Just keep so them going on missions, too. join the military. <laughs> There's only like a small percentage in, in like so, so many, oh, I, I'm excited to get, well not excited, but uh, maybe this will be a good time to segue into um, where's the one I'm specifically looking for? Um, oh, we got some Murdochs in the chat. Damn. Sorry, Weston. <laughs> Sucks about your grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's weird. Cause like, like I was saying earlier about the Mormon prophets who we know for sure, it's just a matter of historical record, married minors, young teens, well into their, uh, adult and advancing years. We haven't like, I personally haven't even dug into like, all the other 12 and 70s from that era, but I can guarantee you it was not a pretty picture and that this type of shit, that Murdoch shit, so common. Exactly what they were saying in the New York Times at the time. Like, it's just young ladies up for grabs by these old dudes who were like, I have the keys, so fuck you. Do you want to dive back in yep. to contemporary news sources from the time? So this is from the Union Vedette in 1864. The article, well, actually, I don't know if this was the article name at the time, but the title given to it is How Mormon Men Degrade Women. But I'm not certain if that was the title because it doesn't show it. So. Um, Dom's on a roll. Are the Sioux Indians going to apologize to the Apaches for murdering and enslaving them and driving them south into the plains? Dude, grow up. I'm not a Sioux. I'm of pioneer stock. I'm apologizing for my own people. Take care of your own. <laughs> Everyone Cleanse apologize your to your own people. <laughs> you Cleanse your own vessel. I said vessel, but <laughs> take that what you will. Like, nice. Okay. Uh, actually, this is from the Glasgow Daily Herald, it seems. Um, so it says, that, again, this is a, a journalist writing about um, things that were true in more. Is this set in Scotland? No, okay. So it says, the worst feature of Mormonism and the one with which it is most identified in this country and elsewhere, okay, Union Vedette, is in its famous degradation of women. This is, this tracks through all of the stuff I read. Like all contemporary news things were like the terrible state of Mormon women. Uh, fancy estate. Including from Mormon women who are like the terrifying state of Mormon women. And it's like <laughs> these people are all sexist at the time as well. I know, right. <laughs> They're saying British people are delightful and happy. <laughs> Never seen a happy English woman. Fancy a state of society in which domestic order has to be maintained by rules like the following, which are said to be stuck up in every house. So this is a journalist basically outlining uh, rules that were 
commonly put up in Mormon polygamous homes uh, at the request of Brigham, I believe. One, any woman in this household telling any secret that occurs in the household, provided it compromises the honor of the husband or any of his wives, or tends to bring polygamy into disrepute, is to be confined in the cellar for one month. Two, forbids all quarreling among the wives, the one who commences the quarrel to receive from six to 25 lashes and so on. This, these, this thing was like really opening my eyes to like, and it's like so obvious that like, of course, physical abuse would happen. There's stories in, in of like Joseph a, F. Yeah. Smith. Like there's no way that these women weren't getting, phys yeah, just of course. So inseparably are polygamy and the degradation of women wrought into the system that an ecclesiastical law recently passed declares the perfect salvation of females to be attainable only through the instrumentality of their husbands. Polygamy, of course, abounds. A man, in fact, can have as many wives as he is able to keep. As for Mr. Brigham Young, his wives are said to be legion. He is described as having from 16 to 20 of them in one of his mansions, the Lion House, where we got trapped at lunch that time. A notoriously dark psychic energy really bad vibes. <laughs> emanating from that place <laughs> and nearly 50 more located on his property what shall we think of a system which not only tolerates polygamy but allows it to riot in its most repulsive forms the mormon priest to whose evidence we have referred names from amongst his own acquaintances one man who married two sisters in one day another man once the leader of the london conference who had married three sisters another who had married a woman and two daughters, and another who had taken out his three stepsisters from Scotland and married them all. This is the sort of thing, yeah, that's such a common thing in all of these as well, is like men marrying every sister or just like weird fam incest, sort of. <laughs> sorry, people in the chats are being like, sorry, we persecuted Italians. Sorry, how the Irish were treated. Remember how the Irish were treated? It's like, yeah, terrible. So glad we're getting out of that. Uh, let's not create any new scriptures explaining why we should uh, be able to forcibly exploit people for labor based on racist, sexist, or nationalistic myths. Great. Glad we're all agreed. Um, I'm going to move on to a different one because the rest of it is just like the guy waxing lyrical about how shit it was for women. <laughs> Wax a lyrical, a purical. <laughs> I don't know, a fearical, I mean, a miracle. So you know that... Um, you know that quote where Brigham Young is just like, if any of you are miserable, then uh, stop complaining within two weeks or you'll get kicked out and left to die and fend for yourselves. Mm -hmm. That actually uh, like was spoke about in like outside of Mormonism. Like it, it people got wind of that and like journalists wrote about it because I think it was, you know, it was like significant or whatever. This is from 1859, the Valley Tan newspaper. And it says, uh, in a pamphlet we have before us, some writer illustrates the domestic system of this territory and quotes from a sermon delivered by Brigham Young, reported in the Deseret News of 1856. Yeah, so I guess if it's being published in the church's paper, then other uh, news outlets are going to be like checking in, I imagine, because I imagine Mormons were a fascinating phenomenon. And yeah. So, um, have we seen anything? Should I make a little point? Yeah, please. Um, while, you know, we talked a little about complexity and people have brought in, you know, examples of other people being forcibly exploited or whatever. And yeah, we're totally against all forms of exploitation while recognizing the complexity and yada, 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 yada. But I was just thinking about... Damn, do you ever start with a prelude? 100%. And go so much into Get explaining so about what the, you're yep. about to say, then you forget it? Yeah. <sighs> well, should I read the thing from Brigham or yeah, are we familiar read enough it, with it? it? Okay. Um, so Brigham says, for my proposition, it is more particularly for my sisters, as it is frequently happening that women say they are unhappy. Men will say, my wife, though a most excellent woman, has not seen a happy day since I took my second wife. No, not a happy day for a year, says one. And another has not seen a happy day for five years. It is said that women are tied down and abused. So everyone's Everyone on the outside is like, these women are being tied down and abused. And even Brigham is like, people within the community are saying it. And it's like such a big deal that Brigham's having to address it. Like Brigham knows this. Um, that they are misused and have not the liberty they ought to have. That many of them are wading through a perfect flood of tears because of the conduct of men, together with their own folly. 
I wish my own women to understand what I'm going to say is for them as well as others. And I want those who are here to tell their sisters, yes, all the women of this community. I'm going to give you from this time to the sixth day of October for reflection that you may determine whether you wish to stay with your husbands or not. And then I'm going to set every woman at liberty and say to them, now go your way. My women with the rest, go your way. And my wives have got to do one of two things, either round up their shoulders to endure the afflictions of this world and live their religion, or they may leave for I will not have them about me. I will go into heaven alone rather than have scratching and fighting around me. Um, I know what my women will say. They will say, you can have as many women as you please, Brigham. But I want to go somewhere and do something to get rid of the whiners. I do not want them to receive a part of the truth and spurn the rest out of doors. I wish my women and Brother Kimball's and Brother Grant's to leave and every woman of this territory or say in their hearts that they will embrace the gospel, the whole of it. It's basically just the whole thing being like- The patriarchal running. order yeah. of the priesthood, wherein the man, Brigham Young, with all the keys, gets to do anything he wants. Yeehaw. <laughs> we love Snappy Tanner, thanks. <sighs> um, I was gonna say about just, it was an interesting observation. I think this is from People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn, but could also be mentioned in Burying My Heart at Wounded Knee, which is just a devastating look into the history of the Native American tribes. Every chapter is just a harrowing, harrowing story about the United States breaking its word, breaking treaties, killing it. It's horrible. It's awful, but really gives you a sobering perspective. Um, but it was interesting to note that um, a lot of settler children would get stolen mm -hmm. by raiding tribes. And then it was like, they're child stealers. And of course they would steal or purchase children from the tribes mm -hmm. for work, for wifery, for whatever. But it was interesting that uh, either Zen or I forgot who wrote Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee observed that in all the historical records of people, of white children being retained by white people almost universally did not want to go back to their white families. Because mm, it was more authoritarian. Whereas it was more of a mixed bag with the Native mm. American children. Some would go back to the tribes, some would stay assimilated but practically all the ones who were taken by the tribes wanted to stay with the tribes. I mean, that makes sense because I feel like a lot of, is that specifically with Mormonism or just America? No, that was just sort of America. Well, I just feel like American families at that time were so intensely patriarchal, authoritarian, like children were not to be seen, heard, hugged. I don't mm. know. I just, yeah. Um, thank you, Net. Every American should rebury my heart. Um, um, I'll put that on my list actually. Yeah, everybody should. Like, it's one of those things like, going to the Holocaust Museum. It's just like, you just need to know, like you need to experience and kind of like get a grasp for what this looked like up close for these different groups. Yeah. And it is really, really sobering. Um, thank you also to Becca via Venmo for those of you who, sorry, I keep saying this for those of you who've been here the whole time, but uh, if you want to super chat us, but you don't want YouTube to take a third of the money, you can Venmo us. It's in the description box. Um, but Becca said, I so appreciate the two of you covering topics like this. Hopefully the next chapter of Stephanie will bring a healthy break from the heavy stuff. Unfortunately, we already read Stephanie before this. Uh, it's a pretty <laughs> boring chapter, to be honest. I mean, you know. The Don't tell it is boring. It's now. so fun. It, it's still fun to be involved in, sure, but sure. like it wasn't Jack's most dazzling week. Um, there, We're already approaching two hours, so I think this should be the last um, news thing I read. But I think this is an interesting one. Mm. So uh, the title of it, this is from the New York Standard set in September of 1871. Um, and it's about the elder recruitment of Danish women. And the title of the piece is Adventures of a Poor Dane Among the Mormons. Um, thank you, Janelle, who also Venmo super chatted us and said, uh, joining late, so you may have said this already, but this is a reminder that it's not enough to bring awareness to these patterns of behavior. These organizations need to be disenfranchised so that they cannot hide behind laws. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that, like thinking about the LDS church and there's so many ways it is able to like hide behind certain legal, I mean, even the fact that they don't pay taxes and yeah. And now in many states are not And are using their fucking report. political weight to influence child protection laws. And anti-gay legislation, it's yeah. bad, yeah. Thank you, we really appreciate the super chat. Um, okay, so. I'll read you what this article says. It says, 
Yesterday morning, an old grey-headed Dane named Rasmus Clausen arrived at the Danish lodging house named blah, 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 uh, opposite Castle Garden from Salt Lake City by the Union Pacific Railroad. The man looked dejected and heartbroken, and soon after he had entered the place and seen his modicum of luggage cared for, he placed his head on a table and wept like a child. Shortly afterwards, a reporter of this paper who speaks Danish went to the Laos in question and had an interview with the unhappy man. The following is a substantial statement of what he stated with reference to his troubles. So this was his experience in Mormonism. He said, I am a farmer and a native of the small town of Luland, situated near Copenhagen in Denmark, and I have struggled many years to bring up my family respectably. About two years ago, some horrible Mormon missionaries came into the neighborhood and perverted the mind of my wife and my daughter and talked them all kinds of uh, rodamontad, <laughs> I don't know, all kinds of rhetoric about free love, the Latter-day Saints, and as it was in the days of Abraham, so shall it be in days to come and pulled the scriptures to suit their own abominable purposes. It definitely wasn't free love in the polyamorous sense of the no. word. Both the minds of these silly women became confused, and finally my daughter, my only one, mind you, determined to leave us and go out among these godforsaken beings in Utah. I protested that I was an old man, that we should never meet on earth again, and that she would bring my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. However, being a self-willed and headstrong girl, she would not heed my counsel, and contrary to the earnest solicitations of all her friends, she left us and caused me to think over the curse of a thankless child. I, things were so different than the way people spoke. I advanced her money at last at her earnest prayer for her passage to go to Utah. And she went over from Denmark to Liverpool and came out to this country by one of the Williams and Guion line of steamers, which line has the monopoly of bringing out all the deluded and converted Mormons. After a considerable lapse of time, we heard from her in Salt Lake City, and she wrote that she had fallen in love with a very respectable Danish mechanic and had become his wife. So far, so good, thought I. She is now respectably married, and I must console myself with the reflection. Well, my old woman, my wife, I mean, kept at me then to emigrate to the far west, as she called it, and I, to please her, for we had always lived happily together, consented at last, by dint of her continued begging to accede to her wishes. You know how a woman will make a man almost mad by perpetual teasing and asking. Well, I sold my little farm, my horses and cows, and realized about $700 and came out to the city of the Latter-day Saints. We left Denmark in the latter part of the month of June last and arrived at that famous den of saints without any sorious incident. We were met by our only daughter, who, to my shame and disgust, was only second wife to the husband she had married the first one living in the same house with her. I was indignant and disowned her. <laughs> my wife- Only second wife, my daughter. It's gotta be traumatizing though. Yeah, yeah. You didn't even know that was going on and then you're just like, what the fuck is this? My wife to whom I looked for sympathy actually defended her and felt that I was out of my element. And eventually we came to words and at last, God forgive her, she too forsook me and became a Latter-day Saint. Whoa, damn. Perhaps it was because that when poverty comes in at the door, love flies out the window. Finding that I could not convert wife or child and having spent all my money in passage money and clothes, I tried to make my way home to my native land by borrowing money, but I was unsuccessful. Damn. Uh, eventually he submitted his case to the authorities who paid for his passage home to Denmark. Uh, I was deeply wronged by the Latter-day Saints. Okay, that's basically the end of the story. For some reason, I thought that was a different story, um, but that one is still interesting. Oh, <sighs> sorry. I just heard a quote that said, what would help is the LDS church donating some of the 90 plus million cubic meters of water rights to the indigenous people living in Utah. Didn't the Supreme Court just rule that they're not obligated to get water to the Sounds about right. tribes? Jesus. Yeah. Um, thank you, Weston. So much love for you too, always. We love you, Weston. Yeah. Again, sorry about your grandpa. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have a few more Venmo Super Chats to read. Thank you to Ivana. Happy Pie and Beer Day yesterday. Yeehaw. Thank you. We, it was a nice time, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, thank you to uh, Mariah, who said, for fighting the good fight. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. And also thank you to Joe, who said, this life has been amazing. Lonely distance. Lonely distance uh, is always in our lives. Uh, mm. 
Not so lonely now, this distance. <laughs> um, gosh, do you want to read any more? Or like, I think we're good. You think we're in a good spot? Yeah. I mean, these could just go on and on and on, but it's basically just women being abused. Uh, there's a lot of stories of men going out and being like, oh, my wife's married this other guy and I've got no uh, way of fighting back because the guy is a prophet. Or... And I spent all my money getting here. <laughs> yeah. So that's cool. Thank you all for joining. Yeah, thank Thanks you. for everyone who sent in super chats or Venmos. You still have chance. Uh, <laughs> Samantha's Venmo is at Samantha. It's uh, in the description. Hi, <laughs> Yeah, we really appreciate all your support, both emotional, financial, uh, spiritual. And uh, I was trying to think of another uh, will, dimension, but you know, all of them. Astrological. Those, yeah, <laughs> discovered. Uh, I'm going to be editing the new Stephanie tonight. So go join us on Patreon if you want to read 80s woman fiction with us. It's so fun. It's going to be a good one. Is that the end? That's it. Thanks for joining. Okay. We'll see you Bye. next time. Have a good week. <laughs>